So it's uh, three o'clock and welcome to this seminar on Ukraine's democratic outlook on its national identity and its prospects for integration with the EU and also NATO. Uh, we are conducting this seminar 30 years after Ukraine gained independence and uh, almost eight years after the events often referred to as the revolution of dignity. This webinar is organized by Forum Civ and Nordic Ukraine Forum. Uh, together with Östgruppen, uh, where I work, by the way, and my name is Tobias Jungvall. Uh, and it is organized within the Eastern Partnership Network that Forum Civ coordinates. The main organizers of this seminar are uh, Sofia Strive of uh, Forum Civ and uh, Karina Shurokich of Nordic Ukraine Forum. As for speakers, we, have, uh, we are proud to present three of them. We have uh, Olesia Hromechuk, who is an historian and also director of the Ukrainian Institute in London. Nice to meet you, Olesia. Uh, Olesia will help us understand Ukrainian national identity. And uh, you are from Ukraine, but you've been living in, in the UK, in London, for a long time, haven't you? That's right. <laughs> Over 20 years now. <laughs> We also have Andreas Umland, who is from Germany, but based in Kiev. He is a scholar, widely known as a leading expert on Ukraine. And he will help us understand domestic developments and integration with the EU. Nice to meet you too, Andreas. Uh, I understand you have also re recently joined the newly established East European Studies Center at the uh, Swedish Institute of International Affairs in Stockholm. Yes, indeed. I would even hold myself a co-founder of it. Even so. Um, finally, we have Jakob Hedenskog, who many of you will know as an analyst with the Swedish Defense Research Agency, FOE, in Swedish. But who is now also joining the new center at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, together with Andreas. Nice to That's see you, Jacob. Thank you. That's right. So, um, Given the urgency of the security situation uh, during the last week, I would like to start with Jacob and uh, then go on with Andreas and uh, Olesia. Uh, they will all be given uh, the opportunity to comment on each other along the way. And uh, we only have one hour, but if we are lucky, there may also be time for some questions from the audience at the end of the seminar. So Jacob, could you start by briefly explaining the current crisis to us and sharing your view of it. Is Russia preparing to invade Ukraine uh, or is Ukraine preparing to take back the Donbass or is it about some uh, about the United States putting pressure on Russia? Uh, please put all this in context for us and uh, maybe even a wider historical context. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, first, um, there are a few signs that this video meeting that was uh, held yesterday between Biden and Putin were yesterday will solve solve the crisis. Uh, this crisis is quite similar from the one that was in the spring 2021, uh, in, at least in the amount of troops massed on the border of Ukraine from the Russian side. There is about 100,000 troops. Uh, but there are also some differences compared to the situation in earlier this year. And the, first, the military aspects. In spring, there were uh, military exercises all over Russia, but this systematic buildup is now out of the regular season of e exercises, which ended with the Zapad exercise in September. And somehow, uh, there is also some different approach in communication from the Russian side. Unlike in the spring, it does not draw it very much attention to this build-up. It neither denies or acknowledges it, uh, really. But also there is a political diplomatic context which is different this time around. Uh, there has been a substantial political signaling uh, recently in Russia, such as Putin's essay and, and Medvedev's article in summer and autumn. In Putin's essay, he uh, the, the, in fact denies the. Ukraine's uh, Ukrainian state's right to exist, and he sees Russia's Russians and Ukrainians um, as one people. Uh, the Kremlin has also 
further moved away from diplomatic engagement on several fronts, such as the Normandy format, talks with the EU, NATO and uh, with Ukraine itself. Russia seems to have lost all faith in, in President Zelensky and the Minsk process. Uh, the, uh, Moscow had the hope that Zelensky would really um, um, be able to compromise and make a deal with Russia. That was he was elected for that in 2019. But uh, Zelensky could not deliver what Russia really wanted. That is uh, a federal state of Ukraine where Russia have a permanent has a permanent veto on Ukrainian affairs. That is out of the question for for uh, domestic reasons for Zelensky to agree on. Also, this military buildup is uh, comes parallel with the Russian offensive on the energy market through increasing um, energy prices and processing Nord Stream 2 much more than in the spring. Uh, per perhaps the most uh, important is that Belarus grip on, uh, uh, Russia's grip on Belarus is much tighter now than even in the spring. Lukashenko's recent uh, statements are particularly worrisome when he said that Belarus cannot stand aside in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. He also de jure recognized Russia's annexation of Crimea and allowed Russia to move uh, nuclear weapons to the territory of Belarus in case of that, that the US would, would move nuclear forces from Germany towards the east. All these statements mean a change from previous official Belarusian policy. And furthermore, during the last year, Russia and Belarus have increased the extent of military cooperation, that is a sort of permanent Russian military presence in Belarus. And would Belarus allow Russia to use Belarusian territory for an attack towards Ukraine and even participate uh, on the Russian side, it would have serious consequences for Ukraine since the close proximity to Kiev uh, from the Belarusian border. So is this a real threat? Uh, first, I would say that uh, the use of threat of military violence is not the goal in itself, but the means for Russia. Uh, it can be more effective uh, to threat with military forces than actually using them. And Russia has stated two clear red lines. Uh, there is no interference in inter internal affairs of Russia and no challenge of Russian interests in its neighborhood, particularly in Ukraine. Uh, uh, but Moscow has shown that it's prepared to use all means, including military force, and that the threshold for that is rather low. Uh, for that to, threat to be credible, Moscow must signal that it's willing and able to use military force, and there is every reason to believe that it is. Secondly, the timing this time can be considered better for Russia. Uh, the, West, uh, the West is considered to be weak and in decline, President Biden in Washington is old and focused on domestic issues and on China. The US saw a humiliating defeat from Afghanistan in August. Germany is occupied with the change of government, France by the upcoming presidential elections. And as before, uh, the EU still suffers from, from Brexit, Brexit. So the economic, political and military aspects might seem favorable for Russia this time. Uh, as I see it from the Russian perspective, there are three preconditions that must be fulfilled before any military intervention. And the first is that there is acute threat to vital Russian interests. And the second is that Russia has a reasonable hope that a military intervention would succeed in warding of such a threat. And the third is uh, that all other means, uh, such as political and military means, or diplomatic and which are less costly means have been used and that uh, the lack of time does not allow for any other option than the military ones. Uh, and I can see that in this case precondition number one is fulfilled. Ukraine is, is, is a very vital interest for, for Russia. But as for number two and three, I'm more doubtful that this is, uh, if the, there is, um, they are fulfilled this time. Uh, but Moscow knows that when Russia escalates, uh, the West always wants to de-escalate. Uh, last time Putin achieved the top summit with Biden in Geneva, and he gained some in adherence to his red lines. But uh, Russia wants binding uh, guarantees that Ukraine will never join NATO, and US cannot 
uh, cannot give such a legally binding guarantees on the behalf of other NATO countries and NATO or the US cannot sign any treaties over the head of other states such as Ukraine. Yes, well, we yeah. shall we go to or yeah, you yeah. NATO uh, is there a, any probability that Ukraine will actually join NATO? Um, I understand there is well, now there is at least wide popular support for that in Ukraine although not in the eastern part of the country. Um, for NATO, I suppose it would be too risky to take Ukraine in. However, I understand that a few weeks ago, Ukraine and the United States uh, signed an updated version of uh, some sort of strategic partnership that includes a military dimension. So just how close are they? And uh... Well, U Ukraine has a long relationship with NATO from early and mid 1990s and uh, it has been a membership um, of partnership for peace since 1994 it has an agreement of distinctive partnership in 97 and uh, and last year uh, there was this uh, enhanced opportunities partner with ship with with nato together with uh, some other countries including sweden for instance but and there has been a long long standing support from nato to uh, ukrainian defense reform uh, however Ukraine and NATO membership is still not on the agenda. And this is uh, due to its uh, also a red line for Russia. But uh, uh, also I can see that recently Russia has changed the red lines. Uh, this is not only the membership uh, in NATO, but also cooperation with NATO and arms deliveries from NATO countries. The US delivered a uh, Javelin anti-tank missile system and Turkey has um, delivered a by Barakhar drones to Ukraine, for instance. So Moscow has uh, has changed the, the the red line for what it's, it cannot accept uh, from from uh, countries in its neighborhood. Uh, or despite that that Ukraine is far from NATO membership, Kiev's cooperation with NATO has increased, and uh, Russia, as I said, see any cooperation with NATO or any member country as a threat. So uh, Moscow has substantially moved the red lines and lowered the threshold what it can accept of NATO engagement in its neighborhood and particularly in Ukraine. Olesia and uh, Andreas, what do you think about this, uh, the crisis and also about NATO and Ukraine? Andreas, would you like to go ahead first? Well, <clears throat> if you say so, and otherwise I would say ladies first. <laughs> Yes, I think the, well, I think uh, what is um, sort of making me somewhat less nervous than perhaps others is that we have now um, a, a different situation than in 2008, in 2014. Um, the Russian economy is not in as good a shape as it was in 2008 before um, the the attack on Georgia and 2014 before the annexation of Crimea um, and uh, the Ukrainian army is in a better shape and we have now already lots of signals about uh, sanctions. None of that was was there um, in, in the previous escalations and I just had a conversation this morning here with a Ukrainian uh, political analyst who says <clears throat> to him it's absolutely clear that this is uh, um, uh, and I wouldn't support that necessarily but that's what he said that this is ma mainly um, an in introduction or an invitation to a d to making some sort of deal uh, this uh, these troops there and and the threats to Ukraine and um, Putin is apparently looking for some sort of victory. But uh, the, the problem here could be, of course, if he does not get a sufficient diplomatic or political victory, that he, mil he may then still decide to, to go for actually military escalation. And there are some issues like the, um, the stated aim of the, um, of the heads of these uh, pseudo-states, uh, the so-called uh, Donetsk and Luhansk um, uh, People's Republics, who have said they want to extend their so-called republics to the entire territories of the Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts, the uh, Ukrainian regions in which these pseudo-states are, or there is the North uh, Crimea Canal, um, which is um, uh, a waterline that was providing 
fresh water um, to Crimea until 2014, and there's now a fresh water problem on Crimea. So there are some, some issues here that indeed um, are urgent, perhaps, uh, from Moscow's point of view. So I'm, I'm less optimistic than some of my Ukrainian colleagues that this is um, just an invitation to, to come to some sort of deal. And I would, uh, I would agree with Jakob that this is a, a dangerous situation now. Olesia, are you equally worried? Uh, well, so uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize a couple of points here that when we talk about the potential invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, we have to remind ourselves and others that the, the aggression by Russia started in eastern Ukraine eight years ago, right? And since then, 14,000 lives have been lost. Uh, about 2 million uh, people have been internally displaced. Um, this is just another attempt at escalating, right? So, you know, so this is not the beginning of wars. We often hear, or potential beginning of wars, we often hear in especially Western media, this is another attempt at escalating um, the existing ongoing war. And Russia keeps threatening Ukraine's statehood militarily and in rhetoric, as, as was pointed out already by the speakers before. And it keeps threatening European security as well, gener more generally too. And this is yet another attempt to threaten it. And I think what's different now and what gives me a bit more comfort, I suppose, um, is that the message coming from Western leaders is different. It's united. Um, it's much clear. I think that now, the, unlike in 2014 when Crimea was illegally annexed, um, they are less prepared to tolerate or indeed not prepared to tolerate any further disregard for international uh, law, uh, any further undermining of Ukraine's sovereignty, um, and that they are prepared to take action and not just voice their deep concern. So, so in that sense, um, it, it is comforting to hear that position and to see that position, a united position, and to see that the clear signal is being sent to Russia. But uh, one thing that I am nervous about, whether this is just going to be a temporary de-escalation and we will face this, the same situation in a couple of months again. So I'd like to see that, you know, that this de-escalation that we're hoping for all um, right now lasts and that it transforms into some kind of meaningful action. I also wanted to um, just comment very briefly on the question of NATO from a slightly different um, angle, I suppose. Um, well, first of all, I think it's really important to remember that it's up to Ukrainians to decide if they want to join NATO or not, and not up, up to another state to dictate and force uh, other uh, states to somehow prevent uh, you know, Ukrainians from voicing their wish to join uh, organizations such as NATO or not. I think if we are um, uh, you know, if we are contemplating, you know, uh, NATO as or expansion of NATO eastwards as a potential threat to Russia, then we're buying into Putin's rhetoric here as well. Um, and it's it's also important to point out, which I think was mentioned already briefly, that the more Russia threatens uh, Ukraine militarily, the more Ukrainians support the potential of joining NATO. Before 2014, there was very little support uh, in Ukraine. Uh, it was it was very very marginal, and it's growing the more Russia threatens Ukraine. Um, but also um, uh, this idea of expansion uh, of NATO eastwards as, as a potential threat to Russia. I think it's here we need to sort of flip the question a little bit and remember that the real threat to Putin's regime in particular is a uh, successful democratic uh, country on its doorstep with freedom of speech, with free elections, you know, and a, a, a basically an example to the Russian citizens that a different, a different way is possible for them. That is a real threat. And uh, he will do anything to uh, destabilize uh, those processes to prevent Ukraine from becoming that state because that truly threatens his regime. Yeah. Um, that sort of takes us to the, the next uh, block of this seminar, uh, where I would like to ask Andreas. Uh, the, the events of 2013 and, and 14, they are often uh, called the Revolution of Dignity, but uh, also the Euromaidan, because they took place on Kiev's Maidan Square, and because they were provoked by then-President Viktor Yanukovych's last-minute refusal to sign an uh, association agreement with the EU. So uh, could you perhaps pr give us a brief but insightful uh, overview of the EU's and Ukraine's relationship both before and after those events? It's an, <clears throat> an old relationship and unfulfilled from the Ukrainian side. I think I'm, although I'm not on Ukrainian, I think I can say so that uh, 
Ukraine always wanted more um, um, deeper um, relations with the EU. In fact, if you look at some declarations of the old um, RADA of the um, late um, Soviet Ukrainian Republic, there were already um, declarations by this uh, still Soviet um, RADA of the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic asking for closer relations uh, with what was what then still the European communities. Um, in 1998, uh, the EU membership uh, was made an official aim of the um, state, of the Ukrainian state, with a, with a decree by then President Leonid Kuchma. And in 2003, um, the aim of uh, both EU and NATO membership, that is something um, about NATO that some people uh, forget, was made um, in 2003, made um, uh, also an official aim according to a law, uh, the, the law on the foundations of national security adopted in 2003 when Leonid Kuchma was still president and by the way Viktor Yanukovych was prime minister at this point uh, this uh, this law was adopted that uh, defined both EU and NATO membership as um, uh, as uh, official aims. Uh, the association agreement that was then uh, um, the negotiations for which then started after the Orange Revolution uh, was uh, something that was certainly welcomed by the uh, Ukrainians, but it was also something with which the Ukrainians were eventually um, in so far unhappy in, in that it was uh, a very large agreement. It was actually uh, not a typical EU association agreement but uh, I would call it, in a, in a certain sense, it, it is an integration agreement in that it integrates um, Ukraine and also Moldova and Georgia, which have similar agreements into um, the economic and legal um, space of the EU. Um, this, this association agreement, however, did not include a membership perspective, um, um, an official promise that um, Ukraine we will one day or could one day uh, apply and become a member of the European Union. So even with this association agreement, which is now uh, ratified and, and working and is being in, implement, implemented, Ukraine is unhappy. It is basically asking every year again um, the EU for this official membership perspective. Usually the EU then answers to that, well, this is actually uh, something that is implied uh, with the uh, Treaty on the European Union, which says that um, each European state has the right to apply for membership and that therefore, so to say, the official membership specifically for Ukraine um, is, not, um, is not necessary. But there are, of course, countries like um, in the Western Balkans and even a country like Turkey that have specific membership perspectives um, once uh, written down in, in this or that document and Ukraine and uh, the same goes for Moldova and Georgia, they also want to have this, um, this perspective. Um, however, this was uh, something maybe not so important in 2013, 2014. Um, there the, uh, I would also make a distinction between the um, initial Euromaidan, which was a rather small demonstration of intellectuals and, and students um, that were unhappy with the postponement of the uh, signing of the association agreement by um, Yanukovych, obviously under uh, Putin's pressure, um, because there were signs that actually Yanukovych uh, wanted to sign the agreement. Uh, before, um, in 2013, he was um, basically uh, advising his, his government or, or uh, telling his government uh, the um, implementation of the or the signing of the association agreement should be um, prepared, but then on the um, famous Vilnius uh, summit, he then um, refrained from it. And then uh, first a small demonstration started in uh, the Kiev city center, um, by the way, started by a man called uh, Mustafa Nayem, um, an immigrant um, uh, from uh, whose family comes from Afghanistan. And then um, an overreaction of his regime, of Yanukovych's um, sort of semi-authoritarian regime to this initial demonstration, um, a violent attack on this uh, relatively small group of largely young and very young students uh, then uh, created um, a larger uprising that then eventually led to um, uh, Yanukovych fleeing uh, Kiev and being then deposed. Deposed, by the way, that sometimes that is 
incorrectly um, portrayed in the Western press, not by the revolutionaries um, uh, of the Euromaidan, but he was um, formally deposed by the same parliament that until January 2014 had been supporting him. And this parliament then deposed him because he was absent. Uh, he had fled Kiev, was uh, fleeing uh, Ukraine, and you know U Ukraine was in in in, in shatters. Uh, the uh, the annexation of Crimea was about to start, and uh, Ukraine needed a president, a head of state, somebody to to sign laws, and that's why then the uh, formerly um, pro Yanukovych um, parliament. Um, used then a, a certain, uh, you could say, a legal trick to declare him basically uh, unhealthy or unable to to um, uh, exercise his duties as as president, and then um, uh, elected uh, an interim president, Alexander Tuchinov. So that was the uh, story of this of this um, uprising. Although one has to say, in general, I don't think um, there was a, a major shift in the foreign political direction because, as I said, the the general pro-European direction had already uh, been visible in the early 1990s when there was still a Soviet um, Ukraine, and um, it was the membership was an official aim since 1998, uh, uh, and then made law in 2003, and finally then in 2019, both EU and NATO membership became also fixed in the Ukrainian um, constitution. So, so this is nothing new, and the association agreement that is now in place is actually something that is. You no, know, it's it's good and and it's appreciated by Ukrainians, but it's not actually what they wanted. They wanted um, basically um, something like the uh, so-called Europe agreements that um, the East Central European countries got in the mid 1990s, uh, which were also you could argue association agreements that, however, contained a membership perspective. Yeah. So there's much more to say, but it, it's a, it's a rather complicated way as well. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good um, timeline. Uh, so, what about um, internal developments in Ukraine? How, how do they? What are they like, and how do they play into the U European integration that you talked about? And I wonder about things like uh, anti-corruption and uh, de-oligarchization, and um, of course, democratic development. There's something called the Cop Copenhagen criteria that I think are important mm -hmm. for democratization or democratic development. Um, I know there are other reform areas as well. Um, so in, in short, is Ukraine becoming more functional and more democratic after the revolution of dignity? And um, how would you view that in a 30 year perspective of, of, of the Ukrainian independence history? And um, in this context also, I'm of course a little bit uh, curious about uh, President Zelensky's warning the other week about an imminent coup this coup was supposed to take place last week, but so far it didn't happen. Uh, well, yeah. I, I will I will leave out the coup because I, I was also a little bit surprised by it, and I, I can't still figure out what what exactly is behind this. Maybe maybe it wasn't quite meant as as seriously as as it may have sounded. Um, uh, but um, I would make concerning um, the uh, internal de development. Um, a distinction between good governments in a in a broad sense and good governance in a narrow sense. In a broad sense, you could say that Ukraine has always been sort of um, exception since independence in the post-Soviet space, in that it had um, democratic elections, that it had uh, multiplicity of candidates, and that it, for instance, had already its first um, change of uh, president in 1994 when the incumbent, uh, Leonid Kravchuk, was not re-elected, although obviously he wanted to be re-elected, but um, he was kicked out of uh, his office by the voters in 1994. Um, and that is by political scientists usually seen as one of the crucial uh, criteria of uh, a democratic development of a country. Has um, an incumbent been kicked out, uh, incumbent prime minister or president been kicked out by the electorate. In Germany, for instance, we had this um, uh, only four years later, after Ukraine, in 1998. That was the first time that in the Federal Republic of Germany, actually the voters kicked out um, a sitting chancellor. 
um, all the previous changes of chancellor were not initiated by the voters, but, but were, were an intra-elite uh, process. And so to say, Germany fulfilled this particular criteria after Ukraine, uh, although Germany is usually regarded as a, as a stable uh, democracy. And in general, uh, if you look at the history of Ukraine, um, there was always a multi-party system. There was genuine competition in the elections. Uh, there, was, uh, there was, of course, manipulation, and there was, uh, especially in the electoral campaigns, lots of uh, sort of dirty tricks being used. Um, in the um, uh, in the last elections, presidential elections, for instance, there was a um, uh, there were two candidates with the initials U and V, uh, and the uh, family name uh, Timoshenko. So there was apart from Yulia Timoshenko, who was a presidential candidate, and you may whom you may know, also uh, a Yuri Timoshenko. And uh, the reason that uh, this Yuri Timoshenko is a totally unknown um, person in, in Ukraine became candidate and then prominent actually. In, in the electoral campaign is that he has the same initials and the same family name as you, as Yulia Timoshenko. So these, these are the sort of tricks that are being used here. But still, um, um, as before with uh, Kravchuk and uh, as before with Yushchenko in the two, 2019, um, a sitting president, in that case, Petro Poroshenko, was again kicked out by the by the voters. So, so I think this part is actually pretty good in, in Ukraine in terms of the multiplicity of actors, the the, um, the real competition in elections. What is the big problem is a good governance in a narrow sense, and that is the, um, the deep intrusion basically of private interests, the so-called oligarchs, into the political process, um, the subversion of political parties, the parliament, the ministries, uh, the uh, state ag agencies by these informal networks, uh, patronal networks, they, they are used, uh, called sometimes, and that you have a sort of uh, a hidden, one could argue, uh, second political system uh, consisting out of these uh, networks of people who know each other and who are then obliged to each other and who um, are engaged in large-scale corruption schemes. That is the big issue that is basically also for the other post-Soviet countries, uh, without exception, um, perhaps with the partial exception of the Baltic, three Baltic states, uh, the um, uh, the big issue, and um, that is uh, something with which um, Ukraine is still fighting. And now we have a uh, de-oligarchization law that um, obliges uh, certain plutocrats to to register um, under certain conditions as oligarchs. Um, whether this will help, we will see. Um, there have been um, uh, similar laws and institutions created, especially after the um, Euromaidan revolution in 2014, like a um, National Bureau for Anti-Corruption anti Bureau, um, an anti-corruption uh, procuracy, an anti-corruption court, um, an agency, an anti-corruption agency that um, uh, sort of tries to prevent a corruption before it happens, whereas the Bureau basically um, tries to uh, catch the corrupt uh, officials. So there's a lot uh, going on in, in terms of uh, f during the last seven years in terms of fight against corruption, but the results are still wanting. Um, and, uh, but, but I think st still, I would still argue that Ukraine and perhaps the same goes for Georgia and perhaps even Moldova are more advanced in this in in these spheres than the other post-Soviet countries, um, uh, Belarus, Russia, the uh, uh, Ar Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the Central Asian countries. Um, there's there's some more progress. At least the institutions are in place, um, but they have not really yet uh, changed the uh, this this general. Uh, situation that we still have uh, oligarchs behind the scenes uh, also using media a lot to um, to influence political processes yeah so still somehow st somewhat stuck in the post-soviet um, swamp so to say but yes. moving but, in uh, right direction. Also, i mean uh, sometimes what what i think is forgotten is that of course corruption is also a big problem in other countries not only the post-soviet countries uh, i mean we have in Germany, we have this man called uh, Gerhard Schröder, who is now um, working for Gazprom and, and Rosneft. There's a huge uh, problem in the US with the so-called super PACs, 
with these schemes where uh, basically plutocrats, uh, rich people can use certain uh, tricks to influence electoral campaigns. This is of, of, a, of a different magnitude than in the post-Soviet states, but um, it's not unheard of in, in many other regions of the world and even in some of the most um, advanced uh, democracies. Yeah. Olesia and Jacob, uh, would you like to add some on internal developments and the European integration? Yes. Just a quick comment about the Maidan protests, if I may, because um, it really was a, a major milestone in Ukrainian history, I think, and it you know continues to resonate to this day. I think really the Maidan protests placed Ukraine uh, on the mental map of Europe, uh, if not the world, or maybe placed it again, brought it back to the map. I mean, it was briefly there, probably during the Orange Revolution, but it sort of very quickly disappeared. Um, and it's important to remember that um, the protests were held in support of what we understand as Western or European values, right? So democracy, rule of law, freedom of speech, and so on. Um, and it presented Ukraine, I think, to the world as a country, or as a, you know, to, at least Ukrainian society, a society that wants to stand up to authoritarianism. And and um, I think it changed something within the country as well. It, I mean, it, it made people understand that, you know, they can make a difference. They can stand up and make their voices heard. And in spite of all the difficulties, in spite of the war in Donbass, um, I think Ukrainians still continue to serve as a reminder that people can feel really deeply about these values, even if they're outside the values that we recognize as, you know, associated with the EU, wrongly or rightly, that's another question. But um, they can feel deeply about them and stand up for, for them, um, even if they're outside of the political union. I think it's just a, a, a one thing to bear in mind. Yeah. Jacob, would you like to add something? Yes, I, of, I agree, of, of course, with the previous speakers, but I uh, uh, can just stress to that what Ukraine has achieved during this, uh, the years after the Euromaidan revolution, and there are more, more reforms in, in the previous seven years than in the 25 years between the dissolution of Soviet Union and the um, Euromaidan revolution um, with the association agreement and the um, uh, deep comprehensive free trade area and visa free regime as the most important achievements. And uh, among the reforms, I uh, would say the decentralization and macroeconomic reforms are uh, among the successes and uh, anti-corruption, as Andreas said, and uh, judicial reforms are, are probably the main slackers. As for Andreas' uh, comparison there on on uh, the um, the democratic test uh, that the incumbent uh, leaves power to to another, uh, this is something that Russia has never achieved. Uh, Re-elections in Russia has always been very arranged uh, uh, from from Yeltsin to Putin and from Putin to Medvedev and back to to Putin. So, so this is a, a quite astonishing achievement for for Ukraine, I would say. Mm -hmm. It looked as if Andreas was nodding there, so I don't think I need to ask him if he agrees with what Jacob added or Olesia. Uh, instead, we will, I think, move to the third and, and final part of the uh, seminar. Uh, Olesia, wh what is um, Ukrainian national identity and uh, to what extent do Ukrainians embrace it? Um, to me, it seems that it's rather embroiled in trauma and controversy. I know you have written a book on the Galicia division about Ukrainians who fought under uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, I know the Holodomor, the mass starvation under the Soviets in the early 1930s, is another part or ingredient in this mix of memories, historical memories. Uh, the status of the Russian language has been another issue, and uh, the separation of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church from the Russia's Orthodox Church. And of course, the conflict in the Donbass that we've been talking about. Uh, could you please enlighten us on, on these or other things you think are important for national identity? And uh, how would you describe the trajectory of these issues during the 30 years of independence? Please. Sure. Thank you, Tobias. I mean, there's about 15 questions in the in that uh, in that question that you asked, but but I'll try and do my best. I guess I'll start off by saying that Ukrainian national identity is very rich. Yeah. In fact, there are many identities. There's ethnic uh, or elements to this identity: ethnic, linguistic, political, civic, and so on. Yeah. Um, and so Ukraine is a very diverse nation, but partly uh, or largely thanks to pro-Kremlin propaganda, this diversity has been frequently presented as divisive. 
yeah, rather than celebrated, it's actually uh, presented as somehow threatening. Um, but, but of course, like in every country in the world, there are disagreements, regional disagreements, and even within regions. I mean, it's not like Galicia or the population of Galicia has exactly the same opinion, political or, or linguistic or any other, right? Within regions and, and, and among regions, there are disagreements in Ukraine. But, but, but they exist everywhere in the world. I mean, look at the UK. I live in the UK. There are national, there are linguistic, there are class differences, but nobody talks about a potential threat of war in Ukraine, in the UK, right? So we have to remember that, you know, the presentation of diversity as a threat um, comes often from uh, pro-Kremlin propaganda. Um, there are, you're right, there are different interpretations of history in Ukraine um, and um, in particular of the Second World War. And that's absolutely natural because the Second World War was experienced differently in different parts of Ukraine, right? So the, the, the occupation, Nazi occupation was experienced very differently. And people suffered different types of traumas. So they might have lost their loved ones to different enemies. And therefore, their memory is going to differ as well. And that's normal. That's I think that's to be expected. But they also have a shared experience of the brutality of the Soviet regime. Um, or all regions of Ukraine do that. And the, you're right, the trauma of Holodomor um, has been a unifying historical point of reference wherever you are um, in Ukraine, too. But most importantly, I'd like to bring us back maybe to a more, more current uh, situation. Ukrainians have now had eight years of the most recent trauma that they shared. Yeah? And that has united them, the, the current war, the war in Eastern Ukraine, and that has united them more than anything else has ever done before, in my view. Um, so this idea of you know, Putin's plan to rescue so-called compatriots, Russian speakers outside of Russia, um, in the case of Ukraine, backfired. Um, you, you, brought up, you brought up the, the question of language. Um, you can hear Russian spoken in the army, and you could hear that right from the start, because a lot of people who volunteered to join the Ukrainian armed forces or volunteer battalions at the start of the war were from uh, the regions that are mostly Russian speaking, um, that are really close to the war zone, because obviously they felt the threat of, uh, of the, the aggression coming from uh, Donbass, and they felt that, you know, that they want to protect their land. So, you know, they are not the ones that ask to be rescued by Russia. They are the ones who are joining the armed forces to actually be rescued from Russia in this case. Um, Ukrainians elected a Russian-speaking president who barely spoke Ukrainian before he was elected, right? Um, this is something worth remembering. I'm talking about Zelensky here. Uh, numerous uh, Russian-speaking intellectuals, uh, writers such as Olena Stashkina, uh, Vladimir Rafeyenko, well, Andrei Kurkov, known all over the world, and, and also a lot of ordinary uh, citizens who spoke uh, Russian, uh, you know, as, as their native tongue, switched willingly switched, made the choice to switch to Ukrainian over the last few years since 2014, but all of, especially, uh, you know, of, of, well, over the last eight years in particular. Um, those artists who ordinarily worked in Russia, for instance, quite quite a lot of the ones that, that I've cooperated with, um, chose to move to Kiev or move elsewhere in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, th that had a significant impact on their income, for instance, but they felt that they were more able to express themselves to, to work freely in Ukraine than they, than they would have done in Russia. So <laughs> I think it's um, really important to remember that Russian aggression actually Ukrainianized Ukraine um, and brought its citizens together. Uh, in many ways. And now Ukraine, you, we can see Ukraine as a proudly multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual nation. Um, we are seeing an absolutely unprecedented increase uh, of interest in Crimean Tatar language and, uh, and culture that we've not seen before uh, in Ukraine. Um, Yes, it, it's also important to remember that there are parts of Ukraine that have been cut off from these processes that I'm describing uh, because of Russian aggression. So both Crimea and the temporarily occupied parts of uh, Donbass are being not just de-Ukrainianized, they're also being heavily militarized as well. Um, and they have been for, for the last eight years. And it will take a lot of time to 
reincorporate them, obviously both, you know, in terms of uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity, but um, um, but but in terms of the kind of narratives that they 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 support. Um, but I would say, so you talk about trajectory and I'm sort of looking back and, and looking ahead as well. Over the last 30 years, and in particular since um, since uh, the Maidan protests, um, Ukrainians have developed a very interesting and versatile civic identity, inclusive identity. And I think it will appeal to many, including those that are being currently cut off by, uh, you know, in the temporarily occupied parts of Donbass and in Crimea. The, the challenge is to ensure that th this message reaches them, that there is something Ukraine has to offer to them and it's inclusive and, the, and, you know, and they will find a place within that civic identity that Ukraine uh, has to offer. Um, and yes, of course, that's for, for you know, society generally and Ukrainian authorities, uh, a challenge that you know, we all have to meet. I don't think I can hear you, Tobias, sorry. An inclusive civic identity sounds good. Um, I'm thinking uh, maybe I should ask Andreas and, and Jacob uh, about your, your view on these identity issues before I ask another question to Alessia. Anyone who starts speaking first will go ahead. Well, I can uh, just... Uh totally agree but uh, Alessia said that um, uh, the current war has u united Ukrainians and the Russian aggression has Ukrainized Ukraine and it's quite um, interesting that Russia always tend to as, as I can see and tend to est underestimate the Ukrainian national identity and self-consciousness and Russia really at least the, the the leadership of Russia tend to to really believe that the majority of Ukrainians really want to be part of Russia and the Ukrainians since most many are speaking Russian they want to be in Russia a part of Russia uh, the, it's quite uh, interesting that they they tend to believe in this still and and also they are as part of that probably they tend to underestimate the Ukrainian capacity to defend themselves also militarily, they they uh, they don't think that re Ukrainians really um, will fight for their independence, and that is a, a grave mistake, I would say. Andreas, yeah, maybe a few lines, perhaps in a way about a non-topic, and that is the Ukrainian far right. Um, uh, Ukraine has been an exception in many ways in the last thirty years in terms of of its democratic development and peaceful development till 2014. But it has also been um, an exception in terms of the weakness of the far right. Um, so the oddity of the last 40, uh, 30 years is that there was always, um, uh, or in most of the elections, there was uh, the far right was actually running with uh, presidential candidates, with parties, sometimes, sometimes with several parties. And um, it did not do well. The only um, uh, year it did well was in 2012. Uh, during the presidency of Yanukovych, but there was an obvious attempt uh, before these um, parliamentary elections where the uh, far-right Freedom Party, um, Svoboda, um, got slightly more than 10%. There was an obvious attempt by Yanukovych to actually push this party because he wanted um, the uh, leader of this party, Oleg Tenyebok, uh, then... Um, to be his sort of sparring partner in the next presid presidential um, uh, elections. And so there was a, a, a political technological, as it's called in the post-Soviet space, attempt to push the far right in order to reshape um, the political spectrum in a way that would actually um, uh, benefit the pro-Russian uh, part, uh, party in in Ukraine. Um, there was also, this was, one, one could also say, um, a reaction, of course, the support for the far right in 2012 to the uh, pro-Russian uh, cultural and foreign policies of Yanukovych and uh, Azarov and his uh, and the culture minister uh, uh, Tabachnik. But um, that was the only moment when um, when the far right got at least a little bit of uh, success after the uh, Euromaidan revolution, revolution, which was according to. Um, uh, to the Russian propaganda pro propagandists, um, a fascist coup, um, the far right faction was kicked out of the um, uh, Verkhovna Rada, the U 
print in the October 2014 elections. Um, the uh, the far right presidential candidates uh, had mis miserable results below two two percent, and the second candidate even below one percent. In in the last electoral round of 2019, we had for the first time in Ukraine, which is also uh, internationally something quite um, exceptional, a united far right front. So all the major uh, far-right parties united uh, in one list, in the list of Svoboda, that uh, got also candidates from the other far-right parties on this list. And in spite of this unity of the far-right, and in spite of the war, in spite also of the loss of the territories uh, of Crimea and of uh, in the Donbas, where people could not take part in the elections, in spite of lots of sort of beneficial factors for the far-right, they got slightly more than 2%, did not pass the 5% um, barrier. And there's now one far-right, female far-right um, uh, deputy in the Verkhovna um, Rada, uh, in the yeah. um, Supreme Council. So, um, so, so uh, that is the, the non-story of the far-right in, in... They're the, still marginal in, in electoral politics, at least. Um, we've been listening to the three of you now for some uh, 50 minutes. Um, obviously, Jacob is one of the few uh, Ukraine experts we have in Sweden, I think. And Andreas is in Germany. He's very well known over the West, at least, I think. Um, Olesa is in London. There are not that many of you, are there, uh, Ukraine experts? Um, I know Olesa has a point to make on this topic. Um, about the, the um, amount of ex experts or expertise and uh, the way, w how well we know Ukraine in the EU. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for letting me talk about that. It's an important point for me, as uh, you know, that is something that I think a lot about as director of the Ukrainian Institute in London. Um, I'd, what I'd like to say, well, it's actually an increasing number of us <laughs> in the West now, which which is which is good, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, I suppose what we've learned over the past eight years is that the first two decades or so of Ukraine's independence, um, Ukraine itself did not necessarily see. Um, um, popularization of knowledge by Ukraine abroad as a priority, and perhaps understandably so. There were probably, you know, arguably much more pressing issues at hand at the time. Um, and those processes that were happening outside of Ukraine to sort of popularize um, or to bring awareness about Ukraine um, uh, outside of Ukraine perhaps were not entirely sufficient. They were often uh, limited to academic circles and quite, you know, um, narrow circles of Slavists, um, mostly, right? So when uh, Russian aggression began in Eastern Ukraine, what I saw in the UK in particular, but really all over the world, was the media outlets, in, uh, including news, ma mainstream newspapers and channels, they turned to Moscow-based correspondents uh, often. They turned to Russia experts to explain the situation in Ukraine. Um, there was very poor awareness of who the Ukraine experts were um, in the West, uh, and and they simply did not make that extra effort, extra step to reach out to them and to invite them to say talk about uh, issues in Ukraine. The situation is much better now, I would say. In the UK, it is for sure. Um, we can hear voices um, that are knowledgeable in Ukrainian affairs commenting on Ukraine. Often they come from inside the country or these are correspondents that are based in Ukraine and know the language usually or visit eastern parts of Ukraine, in particular the, 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 the front line too. So, so there's an improvement there for sure. But I think what is lacking is the understanding that there's a very direct link between strong centers of Ukrainian studies, both academic and non-academic, and the question of security yeah, for Ukraine. And what I mean here is that if Ukraine is not understood through the prism of Russia, if it's not explained by Russia experts, its political representation in the West will be stronger. So in other ways, Ukraine will be underst understood a lot better. 
But for this, we obviously need to cultivate these experts, right? So to make sure that the, there are more of us around the world, to teach them the language, history, politics, and so on, and also educate Western audiences too. And uh, that could be done, you know, in many ways by translating Ukrainian literature into English and other languages, by bringing good quality films. And, and there's so much that Ukraine can offer at the moment. We just held the film festival in, in London, Ukrainian film festival in London. And people were just fascinated that Ukraine has such wonderful cinema, in particular documentary cinema. Uh, so, you know, bring Ukraine slightly closer to, to the world and also speak about issues in the language that is understood. So I'll, I'll just finish by saying that what we're trying to do at the Ukrainian Institute London is um, talk about Ukraine, but in the context of um, problems that are universally relevant, so climate change, uh, uh, disinformation, hybrid warfare, and explain that if we look at the case of Ukraine, those issues that are relevant to all of us all over the world will be better understood. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Well, um, considering the, the uh, importance that Ukraine has taken for our security in Europe, the last weeks <laughs> at least now i tend to agree with you um andreas and jacob would you like to add something on on this well i can just say from my perspective i've been following ukraine for the last 20 years um when i started the the awareness of Ukrainian Sweden was so extremely low that the most important, the most common question I was given was that, what's the capital in Ukraine? Is it Minsk or something like that? But it, it started, the awareness from among the Swedes started to raise, I, I believe that um, there are other things that um, that made the, the, this grow, like the Ukrainian national football team and Andrei Shevchenko, uh, Ukraine's um, successes in Eurovision with uh, Ruslana and Jamala, two strong, uh, str strong women, and um, uh, the first the Orange Revolution and then Euromaidan, and people got more absolutely more interested and started to travel to Kiev and find out that it's a very beautiful city and not a grey, uh, dull uh, Eastern European city. So, so that uh, although there. It's much more to do, uh, much more to experience and find out about Ukraine. It's uh, the awareness of knowledge amongst Swedish people is much more, is much better now than in the, in the, in the previous decades. In German, it's probably fine all along, Andreas, or? Well, Germany is a very mixed bag, I would say, because um, there is also a sort of German-Russia problem as a colleague of of us that Alessia also knows well, John Love has has called it in the title of his book um, that there is a, a certain German-Russian affinity that um, romanticizes the Russian-German uh, relationship and then leads many Germans, unfortunately, still uh, to see Ukraine through Russian eyes, so to say, and as a it's basically a Russian province uh, that is overrun by lists and man manipulated by the U.S. Something like that. So um, um, there is a problem, but but even in in Germany, there are some uh, there are things changing for the better. We don't yet have uh, um, prominent uh, Ukrainian study centers, but um, the, there is now a professorship for Ukrainian history in Frankfurt Oder, close to Berlin. Um, and there are many initiatives uh, on the ground, and um, the, the relationship to, to Putin has changed in the last seven years. That has also helped uh, indirectly um, uh, Ukraine's standing in, in Germany. Even there, we have now um, a certain uh, advances, and now we have a relatively pro-Ukrainian um, uh, party in government, the Green Party, um, that actually that whose interest to Ukraine actually goes back again to Soviet Ukraine to the late 1980s when the first Green Party delegations were coming to to Kiev in connection with the um, with the Chernobyl disaster of 1986 and uh, so the the Greens uh, have a have a long history with with Ukraine and now we have a Green foreign minister I hope this will 
this will also help. Um, but uh, but I think what we maybe we have to still acknowledge as a as a sort of problem and maybe even a problem that we cannot easily deal with is that still many people in the West they discover so to say. Eastern Europe through the Russian language initially. Uh, so for many, you know, they come via some sort of contact with, often with Russian culture or with the Russian um, uh, um, language. And then uh, many of them discover Ukraine for themselves. Some learn U Ukrainian like myself, others just uh, become sympathetic to Ukraine. Um, but I, I, I'm afraid this will, to a certain degree, remain the case because Russia is simply too big and it's too, it's too dominant in the region. And somehow we also, as people engaged in the sort of uh, promotion of Ukraine, I guess we have to somehow deal with that creatively um, just to shut anybody out who who has sort of discovered Eastern Europe through um, studying Russian and Russia is not a constructive approach. We have to sort of reach these people as well. Yeah, I wouldn't have been the moderator of this seminar if, if, you, if you'd apply that. Um, Precisely. Can I just uh, add on that? Some of the best scholars I know uh, in the UK of Ukraine came to Ukraine via Russia, and uh, there's absolutely no need to see it as a, as a, as a problem necessarily. Uh, also, a lot of students who look to study Russian uh, language, literature, and so on, um, uh, Russian language um, literature, um, do come to Kiev, to Odessa, to elsewhere in Ukraine to do so. And I think that's, that's something that we should encourage. And that way they learn about Ukraine. And today we um, sort of try to help increasing knowledge about Ukraine. Uh, I would like to thank Olesa Kromejchuk, Andreas Umland and Jakob Hedenskog for taking part in this seminar, arranged by Forum Siv, Nordic uh, Ukraine Forum and um, uh, Östgruppen, where I work. My name is Tobias Jungwall. Thanks for listening and thanks for participating and see you another time.